my, my talk today, my comments are going to uh, be drawn mostly from um, the, the book, uh, The Means to Grow Up, and then a little bit, as you'll see, from some further research I've been doing in Chicago since the book was published. And so there'll be actually some examples um, from work that, I've actually, that I'm still doing now and that's sort of um, ongoing. In a recent commentary uh, entitled, Let Teenagers Try Adulthood, Bard College President Leon Botstein argues that most high schools in the United States serve most of their students poorly, failing equally to engage their minds and hearts and to help them begin to prepare for adult life. Although Botstein's commentary is focused on the lack of fit between high school as an institution and young people's developmental needs, it applies equally to the culture at large. Even as adults worry that young people are growing up too fast, those same young people remain isolated from the fullness and complexity of the adult world, its places and endeavors, its occupations and disciplines, its problems and dilemmas. Young people themselves report that something is missing, though they're not sure what it is nor how to find it. The means to grow up is about what it might look like to respond to this situation. It summarizes what I've learned through a series of studies about the needed qualities of good learning and developmental experiences during the high school years and the ways in which both schools and a variety of non-school institutions might organize such experience. The construct I chose is a kind of shorthand uh, and as an actual expression of good experience is that of apprenticeship. This was no arbitrary choice. I found in my research a kind of reinvention and a reconceptualization of an institution that for hundreds of years practically defined this period of life for young people. In studios, workshops, laboratories, hospitals, and government offices, in urban gardens and organic farms on prairies and in forests, in kitchens, bakeries, and boatyards, high school age youth are in fact apprenticing themselves to photographers, choreographers, graphic designers, small business owners, set designers, software engineers, civil engineers, chefs, master bakers, nurse practitioners, ecologists, veterinarians, chemists, master boat builders, horticulturalists, teachers, and others. Apprenticeship can be found in such deeply rooted traditions as cabinet making and boat building, and such new ones as habitat restoration and computer-based media production. Learning producing domains really reflect the full richness and diversity of cultural endeavor. They include visual performing and literary arts, handcrafts, media and design, basic and applied sciences, community development, environmental stewardship, entrepreneurship, culinary arts, and sustainable agriculture. In some contexts, apprenticeship is explicitly vocational in purpose and character. In such fields as health sciences, biotechnology, information technology, construction, automotive, technology and repair, engineering, aerospace, library, museum science, law and justice, just to name a few examples. Participating youth are diverse in background, educational status, and life experience. Sponsors are diverse as well. They include youth serving agencies, cultural and arts organizations, civic organizations, high schools, universities, and businesses. Sponsors may provide an apprenticeship themselves, that is, they may be or create a workplace of sorts for young people, or they may place youth with other public or private organizations. Individual mentors may be paid to do this work or volunteer. Youth, likewise, are sometimes paid for this work and at other times not. An individual youth may work with one particular adult or may be part of a staff or department. In some settings, Apprentices learn primarily from adult teachers and others. They may learn a good deal from more experienced peers. But why call it apprenticeship? Although the experiences I describe in my book are apprenticeship-like in spirit and dynamics, they are not formal Department of Labor registered apprenticeships, nor could they be. Such apprenticeships require two, three, four thousand hours of work or more, take from two to six years, and tend to serve adults almost exclusively in the United States, at least. I chose to use the term instead of internship, work-based learning, or some other, 
because even separated from its historic connotation, it captures what is most essential about this particular set of experiences. Youth are working in a sustained and gradually deepening way on tasks or projects in a specific discipline, field, or field of work or service, under the tutelage of and sometimes alongside of an adult skilled in that discipline. Through that work, beginning to master the attendant knowledge, skills, and habits of that discipline, and perhaps also beginning to acquire the identity of one who works in that discipline or field. Youth have a sense of joining a tradition and contributing to it as, as embodied in, the, in, in that specific discipline or civic sphere. Apprentices are typically working and learning in the setting in which a craft trade or discipline is practiced. Young people are viewed and treated as budding artists or engineers, chefs, and woodworkers. Both adult and youth are active. They share responsibility for the work to be done and the products to be created, although each has a different role. The adult mentor is responsible for sharing his or her disciplinary knowledge and skills with youth, and youth are responsible for working hard to begin to, to become proficient at something specific and for contributing to the community which they have joined. Tasks and project have real meaning and use. Writing and producing a documentary about housing conditions, studying the causes of public health problems, designing a logo for a business, surveying a, surveying a fish habitat, growing organic produce to be sold and donated to low-income families. Greg Gale, the associate director of the Food Project, notes that, and I quote, if we do not farm well and productively, people go hungry, land lies wasted, and families do not have access to the life-giving produce that we grow. Constraints are characteristic of those found in professional work in the fields involved. Young people work with deadlines. They have demanding clients who sometimes change their minds. Answers and solutions are not known ahead of time. Unexpected difficulties arise and are commonplace. At the same time, young people get to experience a complete cycle of activity in a particular field. For instance, youth involved with product design for Sweat Equity Enterprises, a design workshop created by a well-known fashion designer, go through a process that involves market research and open brainstorming, moves to conceptual plans, hand sketches, and computer mock-ups, and then prototypes, group critiques, and refinements. The discipline or field, combined with the tasks at hand, provide ingredients for learning. These include specialized language norms, practices, and tools of a particular discipline, its customs, its traditions, its distinct products and performances. The adult mentor embodies that discipline, is an exemplar modeling the practice, the general behavior, and the affective commitment of one with that particular identity. In some settings, the new apprentice is surrounded by more experienced learners. An adult mentor at Chicago's Free Street Theater notes that, and I quote, there's always a diversity of skill levels in the ensembles. We're always leaning toward the most experienced practitioners, and everyone else is sort of slipstreaming with them. He adds that newer participants gain permission to take creative risks by seeing the more experienced practitioners. The curriculum, as such, is embedded in practice and production. Demonstration is sometimes used to illustrate techniques and standards within a discipline. Young people learn through observation, imitation, trial and error, and reiteration. In other words, through force of experience. Describing the learning process in, in Chicago's Free, Free Street Theater, an adult mentor notes that they figure it out by doing it. You absolutely have to have the experience of doing it to get it, and we provide the space for that. Young people's work, though developmental, is judged by the established standards of a discipline. Though, profession, though professionalism and care are expected, perfection is not. Adult mentors hold the discipline for the apprentice, keeping tasks on the constructive side of difficulty. The discipline itself provides teachers and learners a self-evident, if embedded, set of criteria for assessment and often a ready-made means to observe performance. Young people demonstrate and reflect on their learning while they are actively working on tasks and problems. Discussing the experience of youthful, dry, stonewalling apprentices, a recently revived trade in England, 
Farrar and Chore observed that, and I quote, discussions about problems and how to solve them permeate the conversations of, of the young Wallers. Central to my book was an examination of why apprenticeship seems to leave such an indelible impression on so many who experience it. To start with, apprenticeship is a powerful teaching and learning model. As Collins, Brown, and Newman have put it, the way we learn most naturally. And simultaneously, it's a good fit with the developmental tasks of the high school years. In fact, during these years, the relationship between learning experience and development is particularly close. If the design of learning is not sensitive to what young people need and are, and are preoccupied with developmentally, learning experiences will be less likely to reach and engage them. Conversely, when learning is aligned with developmental tasks, it is a powerful stimulus to growth. From a developmental perspective, apprenticeship experiences provide opportunity for the real accomplishment that Eric Erickson noted as so important during adolescence. They create that transitional space where young people can be both playing and working, pretending to be and practicing at being what they might become, and yet genuinely participating in a particular adult community. They are real, but also have what Shirley Bryce Heath has called a what-if quality. They are marked by some constraints, but simultaneously opportunity for questioning for protesting, for redefining social reality, for reality testing with protected consequences. Apprenticeship experiences introduce young people to the variety and texture of the adult world and expose them to skilled and passionate adults. In that way, they broaden the foundations of experience that young people bring to later adolescence and open doors to subsequent experience. As they enter the broader world, young people are introduced to ideas, dilemmas, and domains of experience that they might never have heard of before. An adult, mentor, an adult mentor with careers through culinary arts, which prepares and places youth as apprentices in some of the best restaurants in New York City, notes that, and I quote, many of our young people have never dined in a restaurant anywhere near the caliber of the restaurants they're working in. Young people experience themselves in new contexts with new demands and roles, providing ingredients for them to think or rethink what they might make of themselves. A mentor in one local setting notes that putting young people out in the world impels them to deal with the way they think about themselves and their future and their work and the people around them and their own skills. Young people may be provided the conceptual and technical tools to enrich, alter, and sometimes contest the larger culture. At times, they have opportunity and responsibility to wrestle with the social and moral issues that are at the, that are at the heart of a particular part, type of endeavor or even a particular part of Americans' common life. In their environmental remediation work on the Bronx River, under the auspices of rocking the boat, Young people learn about how the river came to be polluted and how to turn frustration with that knowledge to productive ends. Young documentary makers at New York City's Education Video Center have focused on such topics as the challenges facing undocumented youth, the corrupting influence of credit cards, racial stereotyping in popular culture, police violence, and the lack of connections between schools and work. As EVC founder Steve Goodman observes, when young people working on documentaries learn to ask questions, they are also learning to raise questions. Because, as a whole, apprenticeship is a diverse enterprise, encompassing a wide range of disciplines, fields, situations, and settings, it is able to account for diverse interests in young people. It can also play a different role and offer different opportunities for youth who are at different points developmentally. While apprenticeship is often demanding, its demands are graded, they are tied to young people's deepening engagement and growing skill in a field or discipline. The stakes rise gradually. While it prepares young people for further learning, work, and civic life, it does so incrementally and cumul cumulatively. Its work-like qualities are often complemented by opportunity for self and social exploration. Young people are granted some autonomy, but where and when it makes sense, some ownership but for those things it makes sense to have ownership of. In other words, ownership of a reasoned kind. 
an adult mentor with Chicago's Free Street notes, and I quote, we make our expectations very clear and there's a wide area in there to explore. Our experience is that if a lot of people feel safe inside of the community created, then they can really blossom and explore. I should note that apprenticeships are often genuinely unprecedented contexts for youth. About learning, but not at all like school. Serious and demanding, but accepting of struggles and mistakes. It takes time for some youth to learn to trust the apprenticeship framework, including the very different relationship with adults. It is a challenge for some to be active, to work hard, to learn to work with care, to work deeply and to persist, whether to, ex to accept the idea that the quality of produce grown is critical or to not stop working on a design with the first idea that comes to mind. Some youth struggle with the realization that there is little room in apprenticeship for either bravado or self-abnegation. These are brushed aside by the demands and standards of the work. With time, young people's sense of difficulty and disorganization, or just tentativeness, is increasingly balanced by more complex feelings. What begins as external demands becomes internalized and no longer feels like an imposition. Young people adjust to what they once thought they could not. Day in and day out, they get better at their work and begin to believe that they can do it and have a right to be doing it. Young people note being glad to be able to be themselves, to not have to pose or front or try to fit in. An apprentice in Chicago's Marwan Arts notes that nobody is telling you to be any way. You do what you need to do. Where's Karen? Well, it actually comes from her work. Not least, young people like being around adults who enjoy their work and, and are passionate about a particular field and, are, and draw their identity from it. Identification with mentors provides both a spur for mastery and a model for identity work. Who mentors are, what they've done, the path they've taken, and even how they behave is instructive, interesting, and often novel to apprentices. I found in my research that apprenticeship provides a powerful spur for many kinds of growth, and that this growth derives both from the demands of the work and from the context for those demands. Skills and dispositions develop an apprenticeship because they have to. One is faced with a new or persistent problem, constraints of time, resources, or materials. And because the young person is motivated to cope with the difficulties faced, the interest, intricacy or complexity of tasks and the genuine need for resulting products demand care and teach the apprentice to work more carefully. Working through complete production cycles gives the experience coherence and deepens its meaning. Apprenticeship experiences draw on and engage many parts of the self, the intellectual and practical, the affective and often the physical. They have both an instrumental and an expressive quality and are marked by, and I quote, a characteristic intensity, emotional involvement, and direct motivation based on the immediate self-evident value of what is being learned. The sense of realness and genuineness, of, and sense of realness and the genuineness of contributions made reinforce the experience as well. Rocking the boat apprentices, working with other organizations to restore the Bronx River, saw the return of beavers to the river for the first time in 200 years. Some growth in apprenticeship is discipline specific. Apprentices exert gradually greater control over their own efforts, a kind of discipline specific self regulation. Actually, I personally believe that almost all self-regulation is specific to discipline and context. They are better able to steer their efforts. Apprentices working with a professional muralist on one project learn to work large to keep the elements connected. A filmmaking apprentice uses a film editing program in an innovative way. With time, apprentices begin to learn how to look at things in a particular field to understand them, to recognize patterns, to know what is important to sense when a work at hand feels right. For instance, cabinet-making apprentices develop what Mike Rose calls cabinet sense. With experience, young people begin to acquire the kind of intuition and judgment that is the first step toward mastery in a domain. Young dry stonewalling apprentices describe it as mileage in the brain to know what you're looking for in that particular wall, to pick up the right stone, to build from the heart of the wall. Some growth through apprenticeship, though, is more general and to a degree generalizable. 
tasks demand, task demands allow for the exercising and therefore the actualizing of the new cognitive and social capacities that emerge in middle adolescence. The work in hand may require different kinds of reasoning or modes of representation. Youthful cabinet makers and industrial designers, for instance, learn to use hand sketching to express initial ideas and plans. Tasks demand and therefore create opportunity to develop different kinds of resourcefulness, patience and endurance, capacity to examine one's own beliefs and ideas, capacity um, to find information. They learn when young people learn when to seek assistance and they learn the particular skill needed to, the skills needed to complete a task or project. David Finer of the Albany Park Theater Project notes that his young theater artists work on tasks that may not come to, to fruition for weeks or months. Young people learn to prepare before plunging in. They learn to get started or to move ahead without waiting for instructions or guidance. Young people both can and must learn to attend to detail, to work with deliberateness, to edit and to, devise, and to revise. A scientist mentor with Aragon's apprenticeship in science and engineering program notes emphasizing to youth that, and I quote, if you screw up the experiment, well then, you've got to do it again. There's a lot of personal responsibility as a scientist. You're in this because, at least for now, this is your identity. You want to know the answer. Young people both can and must learn to step outside themselves, learn to be responsible to others, to build on others' ideas, to reflect on and argue about the work at hand, to consider others' talents and skills. They both can and they must learn to accomplish, uh, um, I'm sorry, figure, um, accomplish tasks with others and figure out how and when to seek help. Apprentices grow more adept over time at learning to work with a measure of uncertainty. They do not freeze when faced with problems and obstacles and become able to view them as just part of the work. They learn to cope with contingencies from wood splitting to a cast member's illness to bad weather at a critical point in the growing season. Young people learn, as one boat building teacher puts it, to work with as well as work through mistakes, to compensate for them, to change and rebalance the design. In other words, they learn that as mistakes go along with the imperfections of craftsmanship. Lessons deepen with experience. Stonewalling apprentices learn, for instance, that there are different, that there are different kinds of days at work, good and bad, faster and slower, rougher and smoother. They come to learn that, that rules are just guidelines, helpful but not absolute in character. In the classroom component, apprentices are taught the importance of building to the line, using, using a straight line. But when they get to the field, they quickly learn that other variables impinge on this rule. For example, the need to use all the materials at hand. One apprentice notes that if you're working along and you're getting absolutely spot on the line, you'll be wasting a lot of nice little flat stuff. Some of the most powerful, if subtle, effects of apprenticeship ex ex can be described as self-effects. How young people view and understand themselves, including what they think they're capable, capable of, what they enjoy and are good at, and how they approach the opportunities and difficulties in different settings, including willingness to take risks, work hard, and be active. In my After School Matters research, I observed young people's public behavior begin to change in a variety of ways. They began to use language and share thoughts more carefully, to take more responsibility for themselves. Their public behavior became more serious and appropriately assertive. They became more patient with themselves and with others. For some youth, an apprenticeship experience seems to have a self-organizing effect, pulling them together, waking them up, mobilizing their energies, providing a sense of direction. Young people may try to carry the skills and dispositions acquired in apprenticeship to be active, resourceful, and attentive to context, the sense of responsibility, the capacity to think and work problems through, knowledge of one's strengths and limitations, and so forth, to other settings in their lives. Reed Larson describes these as gateway capabilities, that is, as laying the foundation for those that will be needed later. More globally, apprenticeship experiences lead some youth to reevaluate how they are approaching schooling. They may come to think more closely about what it might take to pursue particular disciplines or careers, how much time and effort it takes to get good at something, 
One might say that apprenticeship experiences provide expanded, but also more accurate and grounded reference points for aspirations. They ground thinking about the future that may be fanciful or impulsive or simplistic, either college or a dead-end job, neither of which may appeal to a young person. On the other hand, they give young people a more generous and concrete sense of what is available, as one youth puts it. On the, on the, on the other hand, they help young people develop also a more finite sense of self. As implied earlier, apprenticeship experiences can deepen understanding of what work is and what it means. Sometimes nurture a sense of oneself as a worker. Introduce young people to kinds of work that are valued, domains of interest. But they perhaps also foster what has been called work role identity. Young people's sense of themselves as producers of work valued by the culture. When young people believe that they know how to master work-like tasks, they are often more open to exploring different types of work itself. In a complementary vein, I observed in numerous instances in research for my book that apprenticeship experiences open up paths to college. Youth make new adult relationships, enter into new networks, and are connected to new institutions, all of which may be located outside of their existing social world. The acquisition of this new capital comes at a crucial time as apprentices are beginning the transition from high school to either further schooling or work or both. Some implications. Assuming the value of youth apprenticeship, where does it fit in the larger policy context and how might we grow it as an institution or a set of institutions? You might ask, what youth policy context? And you'd be right in asking. Almost alone among industrialized countries, the United States lacks an overarching vision for young people, some set of value statements and ideas that might be the basis for youth policy and perhaps accompanying resources. Indeed, the recent policy history of youth apprenticeship itself might give pause. As Robert Lerman has so richly described in many of his writings, it started out as a prominent element in the Clinton administration's plans to strengthen the American school to work framework, but was mostly lost in the subsequent implementation of what was called the School to Work Opportunity Act, and then was completely lost under the under WIA, the Workforce Investment Act, over the past decade and a half. Nonetheless, we may be reaching a point again where there is an opening for apprenticeship and apprenticeship-like learning. The Obama administration has added the word career to its goals for high school graduates, as in ready for college and career. More fundamentally, there's a growing appreciation that, as currently structured, high school does not work well for many youth. The numbers are stark. Of 4 million youth who enter high school each year, 1.3 million will drop out. 1.3 million will earn a high school diploma, will perhaps begin looking for work, but will lack either or both a sense of direction and solid workforce and or post-secondary skills. And 1.3 million will enter post-secondary education, of whom 580,000 will not complete a two or four year degree due to lack of basic skills, lack of focus, or lack of resources. In some large cities, the attrition process is even more dramatic. In Chicago, of every 100 youth who, begin, who, who enter high school, 50 graduate. Of those 50, 17 will enroll in a four-year college, and eight will graduate. And the numbers, in some ways, only mask a more disturbing developmental story. Young people's sense of combined sense of boredom and of anxiety, of lack of ownership, of not knowing why they're in school, that sense of not being willing to commit and, and, and work hard because the stakes are simply unclear. They're too vague, they're too uncertain. Um, the first key to addressing this problem, the problem of high school not working well, is to get the analysis right. And unfortunately, in my view at least, efforts underway to strengthen and reform high school seem largely reflexive. They don't seem to get it right. The central focus at the moment, as everybody's probably aware, is on strengthening teacher quality, promulgating national standards, and improving data systems and accountability mechanisms. However, in a modest but potentially fruitful vein, a three-decade-long project 
to reconceptualize vocational education is continuing and is picking up steam, including efforts to upgrade content, integrate, better integrate uh, technical and academic content, introduce students to career clusters as well as specific trades, increase the number of teachers with industry experience and expertise, and forge links with employers for provision of apprenticeship-like experience. Yet, in spite of its emergent strengths, vocational education continues to be viewed as a curricular backwater by parents and many educators. A long-term decline in vocational course enrollment has slowed but is continuing. And indeed, a third of courses that young people take as vocational courses in high school are simply computer-related. Comprehensive high schools themselves offer a limited range of vocational options, especially in relation to a job market that, as Robert Lerman has, has described it, is striking, strikingly heterogeneous, with hundreds of broad occupations within each of those occupations and within each of those different levels of work. There is, though, in general, little acknowledgement of how fundamentally the practices of high school would have to change to better meet many young people's needs. To do so, high schools would have to rethink almost every core practice, including the nature of core learning resources and tasks, where, when, and under what conditions learning takes place, the meaning of making mistakes, what the products of learning consist of, how growth is conceptualized and how it's measured, the nature of motivational structures, who teaches and how teaching is done, how time is organized every day and over the years, and what institutions are involved. Perhaps more fundamentally, the overriding emphasis in the United States on standardizing secondary education through broadly applicable standards and accountability regimes may be just what is not needed. As Reichick has argued, the notion of standardized learning is fundamentally flawed. Perhaps American secondary schools need to become less rather than more standardized. Young people are not all capable in the same way. The knowledge and skills that young people need to acquire are heterogeneous. Individualized approaches to fostering knowledge and skill, especially when focused on those domains of greatest value to individual young people, are more effective than one-size-fits-all approaches. De-emphasizing standards implies, in part, accepting the notion that young people can complete secondary education with different sets of knowledge and skills, even somewhat, di even somewhat different kinds of literacy and numeracy. It clearly places a greater burden on high school educators to identify the substantive domains and pedagogical approaches that might engage particular youth. It also implies a very different approach to assessment, since young people would be assessed for proficiency in different chosen areas of co and concentration and at different points in time. It seems to me that apprenticeship, as I have described it here, offers some modest potential to contribute to the larger high school reform debate and to the rethinking of high school along the lines that I have just described. First, it, as is obvious, it offers a conceptual model of good, of good learning design for youth, one that intuitively translates the developmental tasks and preoccupations of the high school years into learning features. Second, it's relevant as an actual learning experience as part of the high school curriculum. Apprenticeship settings can extend the resources of high school in a variety of ways. They can provide new sites for learning and new adult teachers and, me and mentors. And most importantly, they can bring in new institutions as partners in learning. In fact, in a growing number of innovative high schools around the country have developed formal or informal partnerships with non-school learning organizations. Partners have ranged from arts organizations to scientific institutions, museums, government agencies such as family courts and health centers, design and architectural firms. Apprenticeship settings can provide additional disciplinary options, questions to explore, opportunities to apply ideas, while also contributing to the task of meeting the needs of those for whom high school cannot serve, uh, that, uh, of those whom high school does not serve well or cannot serve at all. In effect, they can renew the learner in young people who have exhausted their identities as learners. Vocational education offers perhaps the most straightforward vehicle for bringing non-school learning principles deeply into schooling. At its best, it itself reflects many of the attributes described earlier that make 
apprenticeship so attractive to young people. It is a good mediator between the diversity of young people's strengths, propensities, and profiles, and the lack of diversity in high school offerings. Like apprenticeship experiences, vocational education seems to facilitate different kinds of identity work. For instance, it helps young people see and feel that post-secondary choices have to fit who they are. Conversely, that they do not have to conform to expectations that do not feel right. Just a brief concluding comment. Some have questioned the relevance of apprenticeship to the new forms of work and the corresponding new kinds of skills needed to succeed at work in the 21st century. For instance, work has been noted to become more fluid, a series of personal encounters, more abstract, involving manipulation of symbols and information, more focused on process and less reliant on specific or fixed content. Breadth of skills often seems as or more important than depth. I would argue that the substantive dis discipline-specific knowledge and skills are not becoming irrelevant and, in fact, are gaining renewed appreciation as a foundation for entrance into many critical professions. Paralleling the changing nature of work is a narrative describing a less well-defined and less straightforward transition from high school to work or post-secondary education for the majority of youth. Both the transition itself and the labor market as a whole lack transparency, and it is difficult for youth to make sense of the context in which they have to make decisions. I would argue again, nonetheless, that apprenticeship experiences offer potential to help with this difficult process in a number of ways. As noted earlier, in some instances, they can certainly nurture the beginning of a career. For many youth not ready to begin a career process, apprenticeship still provides experiences that help clarify decision-making processes that are whether they're related to learning or to work, and that introduce young people to the variety of adult, of adult work and the variety of disciplinary knowledge. And becoming a nascent photographer or engineer or journalist, even for a year or two, enriches an adolescent self and provides a bridge or interim identity for her or him as that person strives to figure out who he or she is and what he or she wants to be. It may well be that few mayors or governors or business leaders or philanthropists are crying out for more youth apprenticeship for the nation's high school youth. In fact, in Wisconsin, a superlative statewide youth apprenticeship program that has, that has been in existence for two, two, almost a quarter century fight, has to fight every single year for its survival. Still, there's an urgent sense at every level of society that the United States must finally begin to address the puzzle of adolescence, of young people going through the motions, barely hanging on in school without exactly knowing why, fantasizing about becoming rock stars or professional athletes, looking at the adult world with puzzlement and sometimes cynicism, and most critically, having little specific idea of what they might actually strive to become. Thank you.